former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard lobbed a proverbial grenade on her ex-colleagues on Capitol Hill, Vice President Kamala Harris, and others for their response to the Israel-Hamas war, some of them siding with Palestinians. Here she is Tuesday night with Fox News' Laura Ingram. Let's watch. I don't know if Kamala knows what she's up to, uh, but the reality here is when you look at things like uh, what Representative Cory Bush is saying, what the squad is saying, what so many of these other people are saying who are accusing Israel of committing a genocide, it, it is the height of hypocrisy because they're apologists and supporters of these Islamist Hamas terrorists who are calling for a genocide, the extermination of all Jews, not just in Israel but around the world. And we're seeing this being carried out by these violent mobs and threats and other things that are happening against Jewish people literally uh, around the world. Tulsi asserted their positions are contrary to the values and foundational principles of the United States. But her attacks may be backfiring, angering her cheerleaders. Journalist Danny Haifong posted on X, quote, at times beginning in 2015 to 16, I defended Tulsi Gabbard for taking, albeit selectively, an anti-interventionist stand on Syria and other wars. I was wrong. Gabbard is a monstrous opportunist and hypocrite. History won't remember her fondly. Also on X, comedian Lee Camp wrote, quote, Tulsi Gabbard fooled many people into thinking she was anti-war when in fact she supports most wars that don't harm U.S. troops. She doesn't care about humanity. She doesn't care about innocent children. It's honestly pathetic. Hashtag free Palestine. Tulsi, now an independent, told Sean Hannity the Democratic elites and their stance on the current war in the Middle East is an example of what drove her from the Democratic Party. Let's watch. This is one of the main reasons, Sean, that I left the Democrat Party. It is clear, and it has been for some time, that they don't care about the safety, security, or freedom of the American people. And they have become apologists for these Islamist jihadists. They instead, they leave our borders wide open, which we know are being exploited by these Islamist terrorists. And they redirect our security infrastructure, our assets, our intel assets, not towards focusing on these terror threats that are coming through our borders and elsewhere, they're focusing them on fellow Americans. They're focusing them on people who they have deemed as domestic terrorism threats or, or extremists, also known as people who are supporters of President Donald Trump or conservatives. I think it's really dangerous to have Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, it's, it's very clear to me that Tulsi just wants attention again, and she got bored, and so now she's saying extreme things. <laughs> the people that are calling for a ceasefire that don't want to see 10,000 Palestinians die are, are not people who are supporting Hamas by saying that. You're not being anti-Semitic. You're not saying you love Hamas and what they stand for and what they've done. If you just say you don't want more Palestinians to die and to, to frame the situation in this way and make the only viable position one where you support Israel's merciless killing of Palestinians, that is dangerous. That is what breeds the terrorism that she is warning the American people of. I think we're all very aware that we're not particularly popular. She was an anti-interventionist for so long. We are aware that we have sowed enemies uh, through our conflicts all, all around the world. And she's right that we should be afraid of, of terrorism, of course. But let's be really real about what causes it. Are you going to make excuses for Israel? which is, is essentially promising to sow more anti-American sentiments in the Middle East. Like, why are you saying this? It doesn't make any sense. If you are someone who does not want terrorism, if you are someone who is anti-interventionist, you cannot possibly be on the side of Israel, which is why I'm so firm in my belief that she is doing this for attention and saying extreme things because she's making money off of it, because it gives her attention. I'm sick of it from Tulsi Gabbard, to be honest. Yeah, I, I obviously can't speak to her motives, but I do find that her stance is a bit hypocritical. I mean, I, we've talked about this before in terms of the populist right and left generally having a good amount of overlap on anti-interventionist stances. Mm -hmm. And especially on the right, this is a growing sentiment over the years where we have bucked the idea of being involved in both Syria and Afghanistan. I think um, most of the anti-interventionist right when they criticized Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan, some of them kind of lost the thread a little bit and meant that that, that we shouldn't have left at all. Mm -hmm. And really, the take that I always had was he was right to leave. He did it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And now we see Tulsi Gabbard and other individuals who are ostensibly part of the right at this point. I mean, I guess she considers herself an independent or a centrist um, or a former leftist, I guess you could say. 
but they um, they they have completely flipped the script on Israel. Mm -hmm. um, they have problems with funding of Ukraine. They have problems with intervention in Syria and Afghanistan. And yet, when it comes to Israel, all of that goes out of the window for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a tweet from Vivek Ramaswamy that I thought was really important to understanding um, the anti-intervention stance on this, which he says, it's sheer lunacy that we gave more than $600 million in aid last year to Lebanon, which is basically controlled by Hezbollah, while expanding aid to Israel to fight its adversaries like Hezbollah. There's a better way to do the arithmetic. The foreign aid racket needs to end. And we are constantly funding contradictory sides of conflicts um, to the point where you're just, I, I think, as you said, ensuring that there's going to be more war, ensuring that people are going to be at each other's throats because you are quite literally paying the armies on both sides to exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty mind blowing. And like my whole stance on this thing is, um, the Israel Palestine conflict is not my issue. It's not something that I follow incredibly closely. It's not something that is top of mind for me. I'm much more domestically focused. Um, and my general stance is that loss of life is bad on both sides. What Hamas did on October 7th was despicable. The fact that Israel's bombs are hitting the very hostages that they are trying to save is obviously ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the ceasefire, there should be some kind of window in which Israel can get aid into Gaza, if that's what they actually want to do, um, which is mm -hmm. up for debate, but not long enough that Hamas is able to sit there and stockpile weapons and plan a, another counterattack. And in terms of U.S. involvement, all of that is is like a, a separate position. Like I, I don't I don't think that it's that difficult for people to be able to acknowledge the human element of this, but also say it's not our fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about Stephen Kinzer, who's a writer. He's an anti-interventionist. He was a foreign correspondent for many years under the Reagan administration when the United States was involved in all kinds of conflicts abroad. He really saw the beast at work at the place it was working and became incredibly critical of it. And uh, the first time I, I met Tulsi Gabbard was actually at a lunch with Stephen Kinzer. And I remember thinking, you know, she's very calculated. She thinks very carefully about what she says and why she says it. And I, I just can't get behind what she's saying now, knowing that's how she is. Um, but Stephen Kinzer, when he talks about the United States, he says, you know, we're, we're isolationists. We say, you know, we need to look inward and, and focus on American greatness. Simultaneously, we need to go abroad and liberate peoples and spread democracy. These are the stories we tell ourselves. We need to go secure markets abroad is really what that means to most of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that these two, you know, imaginations exist simultaneously within America, sometimes within the same person at the very same time. And it definitely applies to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. I mean, we just uh, spoke with Jonathan Spire, who described Russia's genocidal intentions in Ukraine. He says there's all of these sentiments that they want to eliminate Ukrainians. They want to make that land a part of Russia. They don't support the Ukrainian culture, the Ukrainian people, what have you. And that is a reason that many people make the case that the U.S. needs to be involved. It needs to protect Ukrainians. We have those same sentiments spoken by people living in Israel. We have Jimmy Carter and so many presidents saying that Hamas wants peace. They want to exist on the land that they've always existed on. They'll do a two-state solution. They just want to continue to exist. And you have Israel saying that they don't want Palestine to exist. They have leaked documents saying that their intent is to push all of the people from Gaza into Egypt to have an ethnocide. Israel has confirmed that that was a strategy that they received. They said, you know, we, we reviewed it and we decided not to go forward with it. Then why have they taken every possible step to move forward with that exact strategy? I mean, dropping 6,000 bombs, 4,000 tons of munition within the span of a few days, killing nearly 10,000 Palestinians now, it's very clear that they are moving forward with that plan. And the same people that say we, we, we need to defend Ukraine. The United States can't be on the wrong side of this, even if it's a forever war, even if the lives lost are so extreme that we don't see an end to this. And it's still worth it. We should still do it. It doesn't make sense to me. The same people that say that, that are defending our position in Israel, supporting someone who's doing essentially what's been described as what Russia is doing. Yeah, I think one of my big problems with 
all of the conversation around this conflict is that nobody even agrees on what the outcome or what a good outcome would be if we were to get involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And even on the question of a two-state solution and, and who actually wants that, which, frankly, I don't think either side really does. But when it comes to that, I mean, even on on which territories would be given to each side or what a two-state solution actually means, like, people don't even agree on that. And so for the U.S. to want to get involved before articulating a common vision of what peace in that region actually looks like is very foolhardy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to have to leave that one there. We've got more rising right after this. <laughs> 